Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the planning committee of Telford and Reeking Council. This evening's uh, meeting is held in public to ensure that all those involved or interested in the planning applications and process can see and hear how the decisions are made. It is important that the speakers are able to present their information without interruption and that the council members of the committee are able to hear and consider the material presented. Please note that the uh, microphones are for the live stream only. Only those people who have been notified are able to speak. I would ask everyone else to remain quiet, not to interrupt the meeting and to allow the members to make their decisions. I would remind everyone that council meetings can be photographed or recorded and ask all participants to recognise the importance of the planning process. Finally, could, you, uh, could I ask that everybody uh, puts their mobile phones on silence? Okay, or turn them off. Right, thank you. Right, we go straight to the agenda. Uh, apologies for absence. Uh, Councillor Offland submitted their apologies and Councillor Amrit Juar will be substituted. Thank you. Uh, any declarations of interest? Yes, uh, yes, Councillor Bent. I, I have a declaration of interest in 0048 as a ward member. Uh, I have met and listened to uh, residents there on statements contained within the report. So uh, I'm declaring interest as a ward member. And I would also like to declare an interest in 0194 due to the comments made by Hollywood and Randy Parish Council where my partner is a part. Okay, thank you. Amrit? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's an application here from which is falls under my parish. I'm a former Hadley Gambi Parish Council. So I would say that, you know, I have not taken any uh, part in the discussion at the uh, parish council, but I have heard people speaking in, as a, in a public, uh, 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 when the public meeting started, I uh, heard people speak before and against it, but have not taken any part in the parish decision. Which, which case, which um, application uh, the was application that one? application is 0048. 0048, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I'll, I'll put uh, on record that um, being a, um, a town councillor in Oaken Gates and also um, a parish councillor in Trench and Rock Wood, which borders onto Horton Wood, um, again, um, I haven't had any in input into those two particular cases. So that will be um, TWC. Uh, 2022-1021 and also TWC 2023-0048. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No? No? Everyone? No? Okay. Right. Um, item three is the um, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, everyone has, uh, has seen it. Can I yeah. move it? Thanks. Okay. And seconded by Peter. Everyone who is there, uh, you're able to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. And if we, if we don't mind. yeah, uh, uh, that, that's fine. All right. Thank you. Right. Right. Um, item four is the terms of reference. Um, to agree the planning committee's terms of reference for the municipal year 2023 to 2024. Um, everyone has seen the, uh, the terms of reference. There has been no, no particular changes uh, on the terms of reference uh, since it was last uh, approved. Uh, so can I just uh, ask for somebody to propose and second that and if everyone's, if everyone's in agreement to that? Okay, thank you. Right, item five, or agenda item five, uh, any deferred withdrawn applications? There are none, Chair. Thank you. Um, 
Agenda item six, any site visits? There are none planned as yet, Chair. Right, item seven, planning applications for determination. So if I can, uh, we can start with um, uh, TWC 2023-0048, Dale Brothers UK Limited, Hortonwood 67, uh, in Hortonwood, uh, Telford. So if I can ask um, our officer, Mark, uh, is it? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members and members of the public. This application seeks full planning permission for the demolition of the existing porter cabin office and security buildings and the erection of new offices and a storage warehouse including an external forklift ramp and car parking at Dale Brothers, Waterworth 67. The application is before committee as a £3,000 Section 106 contribution is required towards the possible implementation of a traffic regulation order on Waterworth 46. Officer recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Right, can I open it up? To, oh, no, tell a lie. Right, can I ask for uh, Councillor Phil Millwood, Parish Councillor, to speak against the application? Phil, you have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Councillor Phil Millwood, Hadley Gomery Parish Council, uh, Chair of the Planning and Environment Committee. 0048 was discussed at the uh, above mentioned committee, and we deferred to the full council due to the complexity and representations made by Dale Brothers and residents of Horton Lane contacting us about their concerns. We've subsequently con conducted site visits by uh, several councillors to look at the application and we see that uh, Dale Brothers wish to alter their ways of working with a new build and enhance 24-7 working which includes more vehicles. The residents raise their concerns about the ongoing pollution of noise, light, vibration, vehicle movements 24-7, the lack of sleep and the mental distress. We believe that the current, the board mentioned, will be increased by this application. At this point, however, I would like to say that there are opportunities within this application to reduce the levels of pollution that are being experienced by the residents. And one of them is the electrical use of chillers and not diesels. I'm now going to uh, refer to some documents uh, and letters that I've had from residents and I know time's against me so I'll speak as quickly and as clearly as I can. Dear Phil and to uh, Mark Pritchard MP, we're trying to sleep as we have work tomorrow. Dale Brothers chillers are rumbling outside on diesel causing significant disturbance and preventing sleep. This goes on throughout the night at their busiest times. We can hear it through our walls, particularly in the bedroom with our windows closed. It's extremely loud in our bedroom and I've taken readings some minutes apart. It goes on to say, this has been going on for almost 12 months now. There is no mitigation or strategy to tackle the current noise pollution from Dale Brothers. It is, it is about 50 decibels at the moment from their acoustic analysis and they're expected to run between 10 and 15 chillers at night on diesel. Another resident writes, last year alone, HGVs past Horton Lane started at four during the night. It's now up to 44. We realise they're not all Dale Brothers, but a significant proportion of them are from Dale Brothers. This is a letter that's also gone to Mark Pritchard. We go on to say that the problem is, is that Dale Brothers service three businesses that are interlinked with each other. This has been overlooked at this point. I'd like to say that um, with the use of the uh, electrical chillers, that will reduce some of the noise overnight. But with the building, the building is going to mean that there's going to be more movements overnight. Okay, I then noticed that uh, in the application. Go on, okay, all right. I haven't got it all out. Could I just say uh, we wish to. Um, uh, oppose this 
or at least defer it. Let everybody sit down and let's talk about it and find a sensible solution to this problem for the benefit of the residents and to the benefit of Dale Brothers. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask for Councillor Gemma Offland to speak against the application? Thanks, Chair. Can I just note before we start um, with regards to my apologies? Um, so um, I hadn't had the time to undertake um, training in order to sit on the committee this evening. However, because I actually called in the application, it was in the best interests of the committee that I didn't sit on it tonight. Thanks. Um, chair and members, I would like to bring forward a number of points on this application. Um, having um, been um, the elected member um, for the area um, for some time, I've seen multiple changes um, within the area. Um, that has obviously impacted um, on residents. Um, it is a hard decision, and it's always a hard decision for us here um, to, to make decisions, but unfortunately, when we sit before us, we're elected um, to uh, represent residents, but we also have um, the impact of um, businesses. But however, I think there is a simple option to this, and that's deferring sitting down and going through some further mitigations um, on what steps we take forward. You have to note there's been multiple objections to this. If discussions had took place with all parties prior to this, we may not have seen 61 objections. And again, members, there has been breaches that has impacted uh, residents, some of which are doctors within our NHS. Our NHS is important to us and you know that they need to have a good sleep. There is a number of factors that we need to take into account here around ecology, so the light pollution. Where do we stand as a council when we sat in council and uh, raised a, a climate emergency only a number of years ago as a council? We've got a massive issue around climate change let's look at mitigating this going forward highway movements there's going to be an increase in movements within the area this is then going to have a further impact on the residents that we represent within the area we fully understand local businesses and jobs however this is impact that we live in our borough and we have to ensure that we are on the side of the residents to protect care and invest in their health and well-being to live within the borough. So please members, I call on you to defer this application to further look at sound mitigation independently, to further look at ecology and light pollution, to look at any climate change matters and to look around highways with regards to U106 to ensure that it better serves the residents within our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gemma Offland. Right, can I call Dr Helen Suttonwood, <laughs> resident of Horton? Thank you. Again, you've got three minutes. Okay, thank <coughs> you. Good evening, Chair, Councillors. I'm Dr Suttonwood, live at Five White Row, and I speak on behalf of Horton Community Group. We object to Dale Brothers on a number of counts, namely impact on residential amenity, noise, fume and light pollution, layout and design, traffic and highways. With respect to residential amenity, there have been many issues with respect to the businesses and their impact on the local area that have been highlighted multiple times to the local authority offices in public protection, enforcement and planning with a very unsatisfactory outcome. Policy BE1, item 11, states that the development should demonstrate that there is no significant adverse effect on nearby properties by noise, dust, odour or light pollution in that a new development should not prejudice, pre prejudice sorry, undermine existing surrounding uses. We would argue that this is not the case and there's not enough robust evidence to say this is true. Noise. We know that there is a problem with unacceptable levels of noise here at White Row and Horton Lane and they're having profound impacts on health, sleep and ability to enjoy our properties. 
As Blue Acoustic Report say, the noise levels are mostly driven by Dale at night that average about 51.7 decibels during the day and 51.8 decibels at night, which already exceeds the desired level of noise as per the WHO recommendation. This has increased since 2017 when the surveys were conducted at White Row. It's been widely documented in scientific papers that levels exceeding 50 decibels have significant health impacts, hence the WHO recommendation. You, as decision makers, have a duty of care to ensure that there's no adverse health effects. With major concerns with how the acoustic predictive modelling assessment has been conducted for the interpretation to support this application, garbage in and garbage out and all that, firstly, the cold store unit was used to establish the data set is a completely different acoustic environment to that of the Dale, surrounded by heavy industrial units and a residential amenity only tens of metres away. I submitted you all a, um, a crib sheet today which highlighted the, the, the point I'm making there. To successfully extrapolate the data, you need to control for all the variables, and there are additional noise sources which haven't been adequately um, uh, uh, controlled for. Secondly, the assessment was conducted over five days, and there's no long-term data that's been looked at. The acoustic report only considers noise from five docks, and there's a space for another six trailers along their um, unit. There's no stipulation for EV, and certainly the report by um, the uh, planning officer suggests that there doesn't need to be, which is highly concerning. Aspects of the noise assessment were actually removed to establish a new impact of the building and noise levels, namely the chiller plant noise and the noise from the 10 chiller trailers. What is acceptable noise levels then when you already have background levels that exceed 50 decibels, I ask you all. During the development, what actions are going to be taken to ensure that Dale doesn't continue to breach their conditions of their planning application because all the chiller trailers will invariably move, invariably move to the west side of their site? A vibration, hasn't, uh, vibration assessment hasn't been conducted, as outlined in the officer recommendation report. Fumes. As per the local plan BE1 item 8, it states that the, de the development produces an environment which facilitates and encourages healthy living. Dale does not. There's not been an air poli quality assessment in Horton Lane and Horton Wood for some years. I have two further points. May I just proceed? Thank you. So I ask you, an air quality assessment is needed to identify the diesel fume pollution because this is only um, uh, only uh, um, uh, um, sorry, the diesel fume pollution needs to be looked into basically because it's unacceptable. Traffic and highways, the conditions in section 106, Hortonwood 65 and 60 is already a very busy route for um, heavy goods vehicles, parking up the roads, and additional highways assessment needs to be performed. As residents, we call on this committee to defer this to assess Dale Brothers' applications to establish the full impact of the site where mitigation techniques are, are needed. A truly independent, full assessment of noise and vibrational noise and an air quality assessment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, can I call uh, Mr Nayland Dale, the applicant, please? Good evening councillors. My name is Nayland Dale and I'm here tonight with my co-director Robin Dale to support our planning application TWC 2023-0048 on behalf of Dale Brothers UK. We are an established transport business and have been based in Hortonwood for over 12 years and during that time we have sustained steady growth. This application will enable Dale Brothers to continue to meet its customers evolving requirements and allow us to secure the employment of our current workforce of 105 and allow our company to grow, creating more employment and safeguarding its future within the Telford area. When submitting this application, we have tried to be both considerate and sensitive in the building's design by its position on our far eastern boundary, size, architecture and materials used. We are not requesting for any change of use of our site. We understand that one point of concern raised by local residents is the amount of noise currently generated from our site and predicted levels post-construction. Our noise assessment as part of this application measured the noise at the closest point to the nearest NSR. The noise report concluded that the average noise during the day and night was between 51 and 52 decibels. WHO guidelines state that for external areas such as amenity spaces and gardens, noise levels should not exceed 55 decibels for noisier environments such as industrial states. We currently do not breach these levels. The same report also concluded that noise levels should not increase when the warehouse would be in use. 
using data from past and similar projects. Local business Avara Foods have also been conducting their own extensive no noise surveys which can be supplied on request. Together with TWC's own environmental officers, all noise has been found to be within acceptable limits with no breaches or issues raised. In granting this planning application, Dale Brothers expect the situation for local residents to improve in the following ways. All pallet movements will be conducted in the new warehouse facility and not in the yard as it currently is. The refrigeration plant for the warehouse will run quieter than that of trailer refrigeration and will be behind the warehouse on the furthest eastern point away from the NSRs. All pallet moving equipment in the warehouse will run on electric. The warehouse area will be double insulated due to its box within a box construction for its chiller function, thus further reducing any noise being emitted. No fridge trailers that are loaded on site will need to run on diesel, but instead will run on electrical hookups as detailed in the planning application. In recent years, multiple planning consents have been granted within the Horton Wood employment zone. Most have been on greenfield sites, including a similar but larger warehouse project placed directly beside Horton Lane and White Row. Our intended warehouse is to be built on a brownfield site, be smaller in size, and planned a lot further away from NSRs. I thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> right, can I open it up? Yeah, oh, and Andrew, just got a few more yeah. as well. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, as we've heard, the site is located within the borough's strategic employment area, Horton Wood, and the principal development is acceptable on this basis. The applicant has occupied the site since approximately 2014 when a change of use from grazing land to a haulage yard was approved. This application would not change the use of the site but would allow the current users to upgrade their facilities and continue to operate. Members have heard from the local residents in respect of the existing and proposed operation of the site in respect of their concerns. The Council investigated potential breaches and have recently served a breach of conditions notice in regard to the use of the lorry wash on the site. However, previous enforcement action cannot form a reason for refusal on current or future applications. This application seeks consent for the erection of the new office and warehouse building and as such, the current way the applicant operates the site is not being assessed as part of this application. Following a robust technical exercise, the, applicant is, the, sorry, the application is recommended for approval subject to the section 106 and conditions. The conditions include noise mitigation measures from the independently verified noise report. And that's it, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I now open it up to the committee. Councillor okay. Scott. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, we're in a, an industrial estate with um, 105 workers. I think Dale Brothers do a good job in that respect. But there is a, an opportunity here, I think, to, as it's been mentioned by Councillor Offer and the one or two others, to defer for one, maybe one cycle, just so that the local residents can be assured, because they're clearly not at the moment, because we, we don't sleep by it. We don't try to go to sleep anywhere near it. <coughs> and I think that we can actually, we have a duty of care, that was said by the doctor. We have a duty of care to make sure that the health of these people aren't affected. I'm sure that this can get passed and it can be a, a, a agreed, but it, we, we do need to make sure that we're not making people's lives worse for it. So I would, go with the suggestion that we do defer it for at least one cycle so that people like these can meet with Dales and just make sure that they both understand what's going on, that the appropriate um, uh, air pollution, light pollution, noise pollution, etc. can be dealt with to everyone's satisfaction. So my view is, and I would certainly pr propose this, it is we do defer this. I think eventually we will be in favour of it because from a planning point of view there aren't many reasons not to, but from a human point of view we've got to look after people. We, I'd rather we did it before than after because when we do get problems after it becomes difficult to enforce. Uh, and one quick message because the Dale brothers are here, if your drivers are pipping each other's horn in the morning at 6 or 4 o'clock, please ask them to stop because people are trying to sleep. 
So that's my opinion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Anybody else? Yeah? Councillor Lut Luter. Mr Chair, um, I appreciate people's concerns, appreciate local residents' concerns, um, but it's my understanding that all relevant environmental assessments have been done and they're complying with the planning law. That's my understanding of the report that I read. Um, I appreciate people's concerns, but I'm here to look at the facts from a planning perspective. So my personal opinion is I don't see how deferring the planning application would alter any of the existing information that we've got. That's my understanding from what I've read. So. Yeah, Councillor Bentley. Uh, as I originally uh, indicated, um, I do have to declare an interest in this particular application, and I do concede that I have spoken to the a number of the objectives following the objections I've read within the report. I am mindful of the new town Act, the fact that this area is part of the Tel Telpenrekin SEA, the Telpenrekin Local Plan and the MPPF. I also note there are 12 policies from the local planning support and I do concede the following, SB1, EC1, B10, ER9, ER12, MPP guidance and the new town Act. I am mindful, though, of the objections. The first one I'm mindful of is an objection from TWC drainage, and that is brought about by the issues that I'm already experienced elsewhere in the, in the ward, where drainage and sewage um, is now becoming an environmental hazard, and we're trying to get that resolved. So that particular part of it has to be done and put forward and agreed by everybody. Then you have the objections uh, from 60 odd residents. And although a lot of these are generic, they all have a recurring theme. And that is the impact on health and well-being, loss of amenity, noise, light, traffic, movements, and nighttime working, and they cannot be ordered, uh, ignored. The policies I consider to be in conflict include SP4, bullet point one, I note the number of complaints from residents on both this and other business in the vicinity, also enforcement breaches and condition breaches, to which MPPF Chapter 2, Paragraph 59 refers. It must be said that effective enforcement is essential to maintain public confidence, and I am not satisfied, having researched other applications, that the Council's enforcement activities have been sufficiently effective to address the concerns raised and have therefore contributed to the strength of objection now being brought forward. And this is also reinforcing, reinforcing the Town and Country Planning Act. I would like to know if the inclusion of evective buffer zones can satisfy the concerns and reduce the adverse active effects on the potential residential amenity. And I think that can then, then be done through further consultation and discussions with the residents. I do not consider that the section 106 con contribution for car parking will address the impact of the trailer parking on highways or reduce HTV movements. I believe at a minimum, having been there and witnessed it at various times of the day, during the day, early evening, even in the early hours of the morning where one night the police asked me what I was doing there, just to witness what was going on, listen to the noise, listen to what some of these people are actually listening to. So I believe that there should be a minimum of no parking within the close proximity of the residential developments and restrictions on nighttime movements and speed. B18 produces an environment which facilitates and encourages healthy living. I therefore ask you to consider the objections. I would like to see greater detail on the contribution toward council objectives in relation to climate change, which has already been mentioned by one of the parish councillors. For example, the reduced use of diesel generators. I've heard what the applicant has said, but I'd like to see greater um, evidence about that. Also in reduction of HD movements and renewable energy initiatives at the start. <coughs> ER11, this is substantiated by the drainage objections. The MPPF guidance on pre-application, I would ask colleagues to, to consider if given the number of responses Consideration of the impact only on numbers three, four, and five wide, wide road are in excess of two more than 200 metres. Therefore, any residential property in closer proximity will be affected even more. 
I also note comments in respect of complaints related to the operation on the site. And whilst they may not have bearing on this application, they do demonstrate the applicant's disregard for conditions previously applied and planning consent and therefore must be kept in mind. NPF guidance in paragraphs 188 to 191, the pre-application engagement and flood loaning, I don't believe have been satisfied. In paragraph 154, a feature of this is to consider the views of the local community. Can it be confirmed that every resident in Horton Lane was informed and consulted with? <clears throat> with regard to the objection from Hadley and Montgomery Parish Council, I have heard great detail on that one tonight. In the summary of public response, I feel all bullet points identified to support the greater concerns of the residents of Horton Wood. And members, I believe that we should request this application, as it already been now, um, put forward to be deferred, to have greater public consultation and to resolve the issues that are outstanding here. Following that, I think I would like to see really stringent um, conditions on the application, should it be approved, um, in, which would include wider and more inclusive engagement with the residents and demonstrate how that is done. We should be insisting on ways to deal with the noise, light pollution, HGV movements, and this authority, as quite rightly has been said, has a duty of care to residents. The application must come with strict and robust conditions applied before determination and to include that no construction can commence until one and two above have been complied with. All construction will commence no earlier than 0800 hours and should cease no later than 1800 hours with no construction at weekends or bank holidays, thereby providing residents with some respite and an opportunity to enjoy their residential amenity. Any future pending applications, rather than seeing them in isolation, I would like to see them come forward as a one where we can actually look at the cumulative impact these will bring on the red residents and the rest of the community. Because yeah. I think you uh, put forward at the start that you were um, you already uh, was discussing about this particular case, so you've just basically <laughs> predetermined really what 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 your well, what your thoughts are. Council got put forward. Deferral. <laughs> you just use more words. <laughs> yeah. Use more words. There's a danger of predisposition and predetermination. And while you may not predetermine the matter, you may be predisposed to, to deal with it in a certain manner because you've had a, a previous dealing with it. I just wonder whether it would be better if you did vote on the decision. I will vote if that's your uh, advice. That would be my okay. advice. Yeah. Uh, any? Amrik. Yep. Thank you, Jay. I think there are one or two concerns at the moment, at the stand. The business is already there for the since 2014. All the things they've been said about the uh, problem with the noise and vibration and all that is, is there now. We are trying to consider the application that has nothing to do with what's happening now. So what I would say that, you know, that Let's enforce the, the the conditions that were agreed in the last application when the bridges was there. The noise pollution, everything the, that taken into consideration, enforce them so that that doesn't happen. But this application, I don't think it has anything to do with all those th things because it's, it's simply a you know to just to demolish one and create another building. So. From my point of view, it's not going to make any difference what's happening now. So those conditions that were already there should be enforced, and the new condition that has been set in here will be enforced when this application. I don't think deferring or anything will change anything. Thank you, uh, Amrit. Oh, oh, Councillor Dugmore, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Right, okay, I mean, uh, I agree with what's, what has already been said. 
Uh, I mean, Horton Wood's been there a long time. Uh, I have relatives who lived on Horton Lane, and their property was compulsory purchased in the 1970s because uh, the uh, industrial estate was supposed to, uh, there, were, there weren't supposed to be any properties on Horton Lane. It was going to expand right the way to the road. So uh, the uh, you know sort of it, it's uh, it's been there quite a while, and there's been quite a lot of new build down there. And I seem to remember this in previous uh, uh, planning committees where we've discussed these properties. You know we have expressed concerns having residential properties so close to commercial premises. So uh, the thing is, is that uh, yeah I do have sympathy. Uh, with the residents, and I'm quite happy to support a deferral if it if it's going to make a, di a difference. I mean, what I would like to know is is that uh, obviously there's been quite a bit of work done on this already. What further mitigating actions could you know sort of could be discussed if we do defer it? Uh, that haven't already been discussed. Be interested in the 55 decibels, whether whether or not that is actually correct and. And, and the measurements, and, and as, as per Councillor Jarwar has just, just intimated, the thing is, is that on anything like this, if, if the application does get passed, well then the conditions need to be enforced, and there needs to be, you know, we, uh, as, a, as, a, as a planning authority, we need to be keeping a close eye on things like that. Because there's no point in us going through all the rigmarole of, of having lots and lots of discussions if uh, if conditions are put on there and then either they're, uh, and they're ignored. Just um, um, Andrew, do, do you want to? Report? Yes, I would if I may, Chair. Um, so, in terms of enforcement of the existing permission from 2014, the council's planning enforcement team have. Um, served the breach of condition notice for the um, unauthorised use of the wheel wash. Uh, that's now being complied with. And the council's public protection team also had a complaint about a statutory noise nuisance from the site. And that was closed on the 6th of June this year because they, the evidence didn't suggest that there was a statutory no, 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 noise nuisance um, in, in accordance with the World Health Organisation uh, levels on noise. Um, in terms of the testing, the, the current proposal, we've had, well, the applicants have had a noise report produced by a professional who's governed by their professional code of conduct. That's then been, been um, externally assessed for the council by a further independent noise specialist. And then on top of that, the council's environmental health um, or public protection team have assessed the original report the, um, the comments of the council's external consultant and they've formed the view that um, the proposal would not have a significantly detrimental impact on the amenity of neighbouring properties by way of noise, vibration um, and that's the key to that is um, that's following the implementation of the mitigation measures in the noise report which include um, dampening and the installation of sound absorbent materials on the levelling ground for the, uh, for the forklift and the insulation of um, acoustic insulation on all buildings um, and the important point with that is that the planning policy test in B1 isn't that the proposal doesn't have any impact it's whether it has an unacceptable uh, whether it has a significantly detrimental impact and now that has to be tested against the World Health Organization levels in terms of noise, and the council have had professional experts who confirm that it doesn't breach those. Therefore, in the council's view, the proposal doesn't have a significantly detrimental impact. Tom, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think um, taking the application, uh, looking at the evidence in the report we've got before us, um, and although I have sympathy with the residents who have brought forward um, issues they've had um, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, um, diligently explained tonight, it is, um, it is my view actually that deferring the application wouldn't really do us much good. I think uh, Council of Dubois, this is a very uh, detailed report um, and it, I feel the actual effect of the immunity of neighbouring properties is being fully addressed. Um, 
And I think as it stands right now, taking isolation, I'd, I'd, I'd have to support this application. I don't think dragging it out any further is going to change anything significantly enough to warrant it being deferred. Okay. So, that's good, so. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Good. Can I just quickly ask a question? Yes, certainly. Within, yes. within my statement, I did refer to strictest and most stringent conditions on construction work and everything else. Can we ensure that they're included? Yeah, we've already um, we've got a construction um, environmental management plan which controls the hours of operation. Um, with, with all due respect, we both know that that isn't always followed by developers anywhere. No, what I would say is if um, the, the council's enforcement team, whilst we are proactive, we can't be on every site um, every day of the week. So we do rely on um, complaints. So if there are any alleged breaches, then if um, uh, residents let us know, we will investigate those. And we do have officers who can go, if, um, if the permitted hours at eight o'clock to start in the morning for construction, we, we can have an officer there from seven o'clock if that's the alleged breach. But, but, but as long as they're built in, these residents will know exactly where they can stand. And when they are breached in any way, shape or form, when they contact the authority, that is when because they're going to be the eyes and ears of the enforcement here. So what they bring forward can be acted upon. Yeah. Through you, Chair, yes, yes, absolutely, Councillor Bentley. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right, should we go, for, well, based on, on what we talked about, uh, to uh, grant uh, either delegated power to, uh, uh, guarantee delegated authority to grant full planning permission on this particular application. Uh, can we have a vote? Uh, f those for the application. Okay. Those against? Those are abstaining. I think it should be deferred. So I, I, I wouldn't refuse it, but I can't okay. say yes to it because I don't feel there's been enough okay. um, discussion with the residents personally. So okay. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Right, that is duly, duly accepted. Okay, thank you. Right, um, gen the second case is um, TWC 2022-0914, the site of former Reynolds House, Boyd House, Bishton Court, Addenbrook House, Ironmasters Way, Boyd Close, Telford Town Centre. Yeah. that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right, can I ask Penny yes. if, uh, to uh, state the case, please? Uh, members are likely to be aware that this regeneration proposal forms part of the Telford Town deal funding of £22 million from the council table of the government. This includes the station quarter site, in addition to Wellington and the Open Gates Town Centre schemes. This is a hybrid application. Do so you want to hold them? Yeah, I think it's still a little bit there, isn't it? <laughs> Do you want to shut the door for? Okay, sorry, Jenna. <laughs> this is a hybrid application which has been submitted partly in full and partly in outline and reserved matters to come at a later stage. The areas in outline form with details to follow are plot seven, which was the former mound, plot one, which was the former Boyd House, plot three, which is Addenbrook House, and then plot thirteen, which is the existing district court offices. The imagery shown with these plots on both the site plans and the 3D visuals on tonight's presentation are therefore just indicative at this time to give a feel for the development of the as a whole. The outline description for those plots allows for a wide range of uses, including a mix of residential, educational, office, care units, and flexible commercial spaces. The mix for phase two will ultimately be determined based on the uptake of phase one. In terms of the full application, we're looking to approve the details of what the applicants refer to as the urban neighbourhood. This includes various townhouses and apartment blocks ranging from two to four storey in height with a centrally located leak play area. We're also looking to approve the details of the hotel, the six storey apartment block, which is being brought forward by Neat Place, and the digital skills up along the Iron Masters Way, which is inclusive of a bespoke Neat Play provision. The 
premise of this town centre development is a modal shift towards sustainable travel, reducing car parking provision in place of encouraging city living with the residential element looking to focus on young professionals with access to the train and bus stations within easy walking distance. As part of the redevelopment, there will also be enhancements to the public realm, specifically from the train station through to the town centre, by way of incorporating active frontages at the ground level of all buildings, enhanced landscape areas, pedestrian priority, and of course the removal of the existing footbridge in place of level crossing and accessible ramp leading to the town centre. In terms of public representation, this has been extremely limited given the scale and location of the development, and I'm aware that there are no speakers registered this evening either. The neighbouring parish council of Hollandwood and Ramley have asked to be involved in the development progress, so we are recommending that the standard seventh condition includes the provision of a stakeholder liaison group to allow the developers to keep all interested parties appraised of construction progress. With the exception of the holding objection for national highways, all other consultees are supportive of the application subject to conditions and financial contributions. National Highways holding objection remains in place until the modelling data has been reviewed, but it should be noted that our local highways authority have confirmed that they are happy with the submitted data, and thus the recommendation is subject to the removal of that holding objection, which we hope is imminent. There may be additional conditions imposed by National Highways, and the recommendation gives authority for the service delivery manager to incorporate those onto the decision notice post committee resolution. Just one matter of, of clarity on my report today. I have noticed that the NEEP was erroneously referenced as part two, uh, phase two outline application, which should actually be a phase one full application. So it will just be a matter of moving those conditions around to the full application decision notice. Um, officer's recommendation is that the full and outline parts of the hybrid application are recommended for approval, substitute conditions, formatives, and financial contributions secured by legal agreement following withdrawal of the National Highways Holding Objection. And as we have no speakers, Chair, I'll back to the Thank you, uh, Henry. Um, Councillor Scott. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, I mean, this is um, mostly, I think, a good news story. It's a good location, trains, etc., etc. Um, and ultimately, it will bring prosperity to that part of Telford. I just can't see any other way. There's, there are no real reasons not to. However, once again, we're having 189 dwellings coming forward, which again is good, but not a mention from the council side anyway of the impact on local surgeries. It will have, you're talking between 200 and 400 more people <coughs> need to see a doctor very close to Hollywood, Ramley, etc. I think now what we must do as a local authority is when we're, okay, we are a local authority that looks after schools. At the same time, we need to be asking developers to put money into a pot that's going to benefit the people who actually need it, such as 189 people who are gonna to come to these, these particular dwellings. Over the years, I think we spent far too much time complaining about uh, de uh, developments We've had thousands of houses, but nothing at all for doctors' surgeries. We must address that. Uh, there's nothing on this one, there's nothing we can do about it. I will vote in favour of it because, frankly, I like it. But from this moment onward, I would like to see anything that comes forward to this particular committee will address the lack of investment in local surgeries. That is an absolute must because it's the one thing, and everyone councillor down here will agree with me, the one thing that people will ask about, what are you doing about surgeries? Now I know that the um, powers that be above the local surgeries um, will say they've got various reasons, of course they can't get doctors, however they all need money if they're going to improve to, uh, to get doctors etc. So please, please, can we get more interest in the 106 agreements where it comes to health provision and not just schools or children's play areas? Thank you. Can I ask Bell? You want to speak on? Yes, thank yeah. you, Chair. Yeah. Just to address that point, Councillor Scott, and I know we've addressed this at a number of committees, so some of you will recall and what I will say, and for, for members in terms of that are new to the, to the board. The local authority does engage with the health authority, and the health authority looks at what is planned within that local plan. It estimates those numbers of growth because that's set out in terms of what our aspirational targets are 
and it plans for those. In addition, we consider how those planning applications are coming forward. Most of them are within the plan remit and those numbers that are anticipated. We sit down with the health authority on a quarterly basis with the local plans team and discuss those the parameters in terms of both from a strategic planning basis as well as then anything that's uh, relevant for planning applications. They are not consulted on every single application, they don't want to be consulted on every single application because they have planned for growth that's uh, identified in the local plan. They are the ones that would request money. They would have to identify that there is a need for the money so that it, it's, it meets the requirements of a Section 106 obligation, such as our Education Authority does or our Highway Authority does. They demonstrate the need for that amount of money. So we can't just collect a pot of money that's, that's separate. So but I want to be clear, though, it has to be evidence-based, and the people to give us the evidence that there is need are the health authority, and they would make that request, and then we would identify that and deal with that through the planning application. Now, at no point has the, the health authority requested that at this moment in time, and please don't take it as that we're not engaging, we are engaging. Okay, well, I was just a meeting with the integrated care system, because they're going around the county telling everyone how wonderful Future Fit is and how or whatever they call it nowadays uh, and it's Wait, fantastic it. and one or two people said in this, in this meeting what about surgeries because they always say that which is a fair, fair comment and I happen to say um, that the ICS and local surgeries could make requests towards getting monies from 106 and their answer was we didn't know that we could it's the ICS that would make the request. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. But they said they didn't know they could. Well, we are talking with their estates team, and that is a regular basis. Um, and um, there's a member of our policy team, which is in the audience as well, that is part of that in terms of those conversations. We have them, and at no point have they made any requests. And that's the point. They, the, the people that are that need to know are involved in that and perhaps that you should uh, if you want to pass the details as you have done for the new ports before that i would quite yeah. happily give the details of the people that we are talking to okay thank yeah. you because i think it's something that really does need addressing thank yeah. you thank, thank you peter Councillor bentley thank you um, well i have to say you know, i'm pleased that this particular application is coming forward at long last we've heard about it for a number of years now and it fits into the vision that Michael Barker launched in probably 2006, 7, something like that, with regards to uh, a vibrant and inclusive temple town centre, which we pride that is, well, it still is, isn't it? The shopping mall, and that's all it is. I agree with the comments in there from Hollingswood and Randley Parish Council. I'm disappointed I didn't see from other neighbour parish councils uh, any comments, but uh, uh, to support as well. The only other comment I'd make, um, and I would support what uh, Councillor Scott just said on health and provisions and such like, within the, the uh, designs and everything that you see in here, I would like to see something a bit more um, vibrant in, in that, um, a bit more break up in the materials that they're proposing to use. It looks pretty bland in my view. We can improve that, the quality of how it looks and everything. Potentially even have a few more higher buildings in there. All right. Councillor Dugmore. Yeah, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I, I too have been looking forward to this coming forward to seeing what, what was being proposed. Uh, I mean, as it points out in the report, it's a not, not for profit driven, uh, what is a re regeneration scheme. Uh, I would agree with Councillor Bentley. I would prefer it to have be a little a more iconic because the thing is is that uh, it's the gateway to the town centre and yes it looks like a big block of flats and it doesn't look anything particularly different <coughs> or you know, sort of iconic if you like whatever that means uh, I was a bit concerned that the ward members didn't make a comment because I would have thought something as big as this, <laughs> that uh, <coughs> they would have had a, an opinion, even if they didn't like it. Uh, the, uh, and uh, it's, you know, I just think that, uh, that it, 
you know, parts of it look a bit sort of like, oh, you know, it just doesn't look like a modern sort of vibrant area. Uh, now then, coming on to what Councillor Scott was intimating, I mean, option one provides 1,140 dwellings. Now that's fairly sizable, because if, if there's only two people in each of them, that's, you know, nearly two and a quarter thousand extra residents. And yeah, I mean, that will put pressure on every, every service. Uh, now then, it wouldn't be big enough to generate a new surgery by any stretch of the imagination. Unfortunately, uh, Mallinsley practice is part of Teldoc, so can absorb uh, extra, extra numbers. Uh, but, uh, but I think, you know, sort of with that level, option two is 240 dwellings, uh, but there's, you know, 51,000 squ square metres of, uh, of office space. So I'm not surprised that Highways England are a bit twitchy about this, uh, because the pressure on the road system is going to be vastly increased. And that comes on to the loss of the footbridge, which is a very, very large error in my judgment. The reason why we can hear the films in the cinema here is because they wanted to put the cinema opposite the McDonald's car park, where the other office building, I can't remember what office building it is. And fortunately, uh, they agreed uh, with, with what we discussed uh, at, uh, at the briefing that having loads of people milling around on the, on the one-way system was probably not a good idea. And that is exactly what you're going to get without a footbridge. And funnily enough, I was at the town centre this, this afternoon and I had to drive under the footbridge and I counted about 20, 30 people walking across it and I also watched a car narrowly avoid somebody who was trying to cross the road at street level. And that sort of, you know, so if I could have filmed it, I would have done. Because, you know, the whole point is, is that we don't want people milling around roads and the road's busy enough as it is without putting further traffic on there. Although it's difficult to see how much further traffic there would be because of the woeful, inadequate car parking that there is there. So, talking of car parking, we'll come on to the hotel. You're going to have a 142 bed hotel <coughs> with 37 parking spaces. Now, on our own planning uh, parking regulations, that equates to, equates to 26%. Now then, I can't believe that any hotelier would ever see it as commercially viable to have such a large hotel with so little car parking, because that's one of the main facilities, particularly if you're trying to conference traffic for the international centre, they're going to come by car, which means then that they'll have to park on the town centre car park, and we know how bad that gets, particularly at Christmas time, and uh, uh, also it will mean that people will be having to cross the road with their luggage at the ground level. So not really the best idea. And certainly, if the hotel does, does fail, well, then it might end up the same as the White House and Maidley Court, full of asylum seekers, because they don't require cars. So I do think that that needs looking at quite seriously. If you're going to have a commercial project, you've got to make it attractive enough so that people will actually take it on. And also, uh, with the loss of the footbridge, the whole point of the footbridge was to give access from the station on one level. Because people with mobility issues, if, they, if they're crossing the, the, the one-way system outside Derby House, uh, sorry, the, the, the ring road at Derby House, well, if you notice, the reason why there's a footbridge is because there's quite a steep slope for you to go up to actually be on level with the, uh, with the town centre. So I'm surprised that the, uh, that the access officer, or whatever they're called, uh, is, is supportive of this because it makes it even more difficult for people 
uh, who may have mobility issues to get from the station to the town centre. So, the, I'd be interested to know from the officers what the dwellings, uh, what the dwelling density is going to be as well, because that doesn't appear on here. And, uh, and also, because the, uh, the flats are, it says, are designed for young professionals, uh, there doesn't, you know, there needs to, we, we need to make sure these people, they're not going to have any, any uh, they're not going to be, be able to have any parking space and there, is, there isn't sufficient cycling, uh, cycling provision for them. So if they're going to be carless and bikeless, well then basically their shopping is going to be delivered or if their food, Uber Eats or whoever is going to, so there needs to be, if you've got a thousand dwellings there, you're going to have a hell of a lot of delivery vans going at all times of the day and night, Amazon, Amazon Prime, etc. So you do need to take that into account because it's going to be the modern way of living. And uh, so, uh, you know, I do, I do find that these are quite, to me, they're quite basic questions. I, I don't understand why uh, this is being, this particular, uh, uh, these particular proposals. Are, are deemed acceptable because they certainly won't be acceptable in, in, in other cases. Uh, the, uh, I would like to point out, you know, being a, uh, sort of like at 8.95, where the commercial properties says a pharmacy, well, I can assure you there won't be any pharmacy going there, uh, quite honestly, because uh, there's a lot of them closing down at the moment because there isn't enough business. So, so you know, sort of, uh, it, it, I would bear that in mind, particularly, you know, since we just discussed, discussed doctors. So I'd like to sort of, you know, sort of find out from, from the officer why these, why these issues uh, are, going to be, are going to be created in, the, in this uh, application. Thank you, Councillor Ben. Yeah. Amory? Yeah? Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, when I was elected in 2011, we had a civic office. Uh, within four years, it turned into Vesta. Now, the next four years, Aaron Book is going to be cost. I don't know where we go next. What's going to <laughs> where the council go next? Anyway, that's the point. I'm glad that you know this application come through. There has been a lot of work going on there, and we do need this to make our town a viable living place for people to visit, come work and bring the business here. So I'm all for it. There are a few issues like parking and things. I'm sure the studies have been done to make sure that the whatever has been exposed is on the right track. Benchmarks have been taken. So I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm really excited to see this development. I think it's a really, really great thing for the town. It's, it's a huge investment into Telford. Um, not only that, it's going to create a lot of jobs. It's going to create a lot of jobs in in terms of the hotel. Uh, it's exciting to see that there's, there's also the digital skills and enterprise hub that's, that's incorporated into this. Um, and it's also good to see a mixture of different types of housing, different types of apartments. Uh, I think it's a really well thought out scheme. Um, and I think it will really add something to Telford, specifically that area of Telford, because there have been times where it has felt like a big shopping centre and a road and then satellite towns around it. And I think it will really, really create more of a community uh, in the centre of Telford and, and create a real town in Telford. Um, and I'm really, really excited to see it happen. So I'm, I'm really all for it. I completely support it. Thank you. Tom, Thomas? Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> this is my very first ever planning committee meeting. Uh, and when I received my uh, papers through the letterbox and saw the size of this application, I was a bit overwhelmed. And it took me an hour and a half to get through it. But having seen a tremendous amount of detail in this application, I have to say it's an inspiring application. I think, especially in regards to moving away from using cars, um, and I, I do share some of the concerns about spaces and cycle provision that have been mentioned by other members. Um, but we, we talk a lot about um, the road will shift away from vehicles and tackle climate change and there's always a lot of
carrot and for me never enough stick. But when this application succeeds and that for us is having this mixture of commercial and residential right in the heart of Telford, right next to the uh, train station, right next to the town centre, the jobs and everything else that have been mentioned and created. Um, I think it's fantastic and I think I'd, I'd be very, very much happy to support it um, as long as all the uh, conditions are met. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I kind of agree with whatever it says. Having cycling makes a massive difference. Get away from these noise pollution. As I, I walk a lot, I have concerns about the footbridge though. Mm. Because walking across that road is quite dangerous and I'm a pedestrian. So I see it from that sort of point of view. So yeah, yeah I've got concerns about the footbridge. I'm ready. I don't know if, uh, Penny, Penny, do you want to uh, come back on that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, quickly, you oh, sorry, back. sorry. Oh, quickly, you want to come back on the, on the comments that have been made. I understand where um, Councillor Dugmore is coming from in regards to that, but that initial vision was all about pedestrianisation uh, and, and um, that, that kind of thing. I understand uh, what Council Duar is saying about uh, Addenbrook House. And what he said about um, the original civic offices being sold to Asda. Because uh, that is fact. But had we have continued in the administration, we would have had proper civic offices in Southwater. But that's another point. <laughs> now, we've put in all our people into that decrepit building called Derby House. So maybe we should consider how we can improve their environment as well. Yeah, knock that down. Yeah, that'll do it. We can't knock it down, we've got too big a lead on it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just, a, just a couple of points, really, just to pick up on some of the comments. I think the footbridge was, was mentioned by a couple of you. I think what we need to focus on is we're not just simply removing the footbridge and leaving it as is, and people are expected to just find their way to the town centre. The whole premise of the application is that that route from the train station through to the town centre with this new level crossing is going to be vast improvements. There's going to be pedestrian priority, the road's going to be narrow, so the crossing's going to be narrower, there's going to be ramped access up the incline leading up to where Aldi is. So whilst the footbridge is used now because it's all one level, but the inclines itself on the leading up to the footbridge aren't meeting the current standards. So the whole premise of this is that it will meet the current standards and actually be an improvement to accessibility for all users. And I think that's, that's what we need to bear in mind. Um, just in terms of the car parking, obviously I'm aware of it, you know, it is a concern. Um, we are using this as a modal shift towards sustainable travel. And I think the key thing really is going to be ensuring that we secure that both through the travel plans and monitor it through the travel plans to ensure that people are sticking to that sustainable mode of tra travel. So if, if we find that we're not doing that, then there needs to be changes. But ultimately, the local highways authority are happy with it, subject to us securing the travel plans in place to make sure that all the users, the different elements, so your residential, your hotel, all those user, users will be aware that them living on the site or them visiting the site that is going to be more of a sustainable community and they're expected to use sustainable travel to get there. Um, in terms of the no about delivery vehicles, I think that's, that's something, you know, across the, you know, nationwide, it's something everybody does, everybody goes on Amazon, everybody orders their food online and it's not something we can really control. I think we've just got to remember that the site is very centrally located. We've got an app. Not a, not a plan. Yeah, so absolutely. So we've got there's got to be spaces there. If, if, if you're going to have, uh, if, if you're going to dissuade people from having private vehicles, <coughs> you're still going to have to have parking bays for these for delivery vehicles, or else you're going to get congestion because it's going to take a while for an Amazon man to work his way through 250 flats. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I think that's the case again nationwide. There will always be you know delivery van, vans delivering parcels or food, and it's not really something that we can control. We've got an audio. Right, it's been um, proposed we have to move the vote, so uh, the recommendation. Uh, everyone yeah, everyone for it. That, yeah, it yeah. And I would applaud the officers on their yeah. work on this one. Well, that's unanimous. So. Could I just say as well, going on from what Michael there, sorry, Councillor Dugmore said, if the pharmacy doesn't go there, we can stick a McDonald's or a Kentucky Fried. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't unanimous. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I abstain because I, oh, I, agree with, I, I agree with it to a certain extent, but there's more work needs to be done. All right.
Sorry, sorry Councillor Dugmore. All right, I, I didn't see you. Yeah, all right. Okay, so yeah, everyone's for it except for uh, Councillor Dugmore uh, abstaining. Okay, so thank you. Right, um, next one is a. Um, where are we? Three. Right. Um, TWC 2022-1021, the warehouse, Cockshut Road, Oaken Gates. Um, Marcus? Thank you, Chair. Thank All you, right. Sir. Seeks planning permission for the change of use of the warehouse at Cockshut Road in Oaken Gates from furniture retailing, although it's currently vacant, uh, to a children's day nursery for 32 kids. Uh, the application also proposes a single storey extension to the front of the unit to house office floor space and toilet facilities. The main building itself will contain indoor play space and dining facilities for the children with an outdoor play area to the east of the site and staff parking within the site for four members of staff and the southern bit of the site. <coughs> it's proposed that the public car park to the northwest will be utilised for parent drop-offs with a pedestrian link to the site across, across Cockshut Road. Uh, a 106, section 106 is proposed to secure uh, a traffic regulation order if it's necessary, but that, I don't know whether you can see from the plans where the yellow lines might be. They basically run the whole length of the site on both sides of the road, but you probably can't see it too much from the plans because they're quite, uh, quite small. Now, the application accords with policy COM 1 of the local plan in that it provides a new and much needed community facility. Uh, approval is recommended subject to the 106 and conditions in the agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've got nobody to speak either for or against it, so we'll go straight forward to uh, the members. Okay, uh, no, uh, Nigel. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, I've got no problems with it at all. Uh, the only thing is, I just wondered whether or not it's been discussed because the staff parking and turning, wouldn't that be a better drop off point for children because then they don't have to cross the road and have the staff parking in the public car park, do it the other way around because uh, I'm thinking more of the safe, safety of the kids because uh, it's you know, a bit of a strange junction. Yeah, sorry. Okay, uh, I think in terms of manoeuvrability it would cause difficulties within the site and it would be more of a highways issue for the highways officer in terms of using it for a drop off so that they think it's a better idea to use the drop off in the public car park and link, and link it. Is that all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I would recommend this one, yes, empty building to children's homes. Okay. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, I think it's a really good use of the building for one thing. Um, the safety of people has been taken very seriously on this one. I'm really pleased to see about extra crossings. Uh, the car park is in a good position. I'd avoid going further up the road though, because I went along today and looked at it and I got stuck. I had to turn around in a drive that said no turning and the guy came out and he gave me another earful. But there you go. Uh, it's really good that this is, this is being used for this purpose. I cannot see one negative about it, so I would be happy, happy to support it. Okay. Oh. No, no. Amri? I've I got no problem with this, uh, this uh, application. I think it's a good one. Thank you. Right, good. Okay, so we don't, don't think we can mark us. You, you don't need to come back on that one, please. You, you're quite up. All right. So, uh, can we have a vote for to uh, to move? Yeah. Everyone for it? Brilliant. Thank you. Unanimous. Thank you. Right. The fourth one is the TWC uh, 2019 0104, the land between Hartfield House and 41 Paul Hill Road, Horsay, Telford. So if I can ask for... Andy. Yeah. yeah. Andy? Thank you, Jan. Back on again. <laughs> so the application seeks a deed of variation to the Section 106 agreement associated with this development for 36 dwellings. The application seeks to vary the terms to reduce the 
amount of financial contribution and reduce the, amount, the percentage of affordable housing. The report outlines in detail the proposed reductions and discusses the assessment of the viability report submitted by the applicant. The, the applicant is here to speak, Chair, so I'll hand back to you. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, right. Can I ask for Mr. Nick Light? Is it so? Is that how? So how you Well done. Well done. Okay. <laughs> well done. <laughs> There's not many of us. Does this thing work? Or we're not bothering with this. It, it, it should do. It. Yeah. Yeah. You can hear us. Always press. Okay. We'll we'll hear you. Don't worry. We're not in a big room, are we? <coughs> well done. Right. Well done. Okay. Yeah. No thanks. Our request is driven by an ex unexpected change in market conditions since the purchase of the site. Central and Country bought the site in March 21 for 1.125 million, actually from the Council and Homes England, and entered into a Section 106 unilateral undertaking, which included 25% affordable housing. That was nine units, and contributions of £196,000 in April 2021. We subsequently submitted a reserve matters application in May 2022. Since purchase quantitative easing, Brexit, the pandemic, Ukraine war, they've all driven up build costs significantly higher since the purchase and sales values have overall fallen due to rising interest rates and mortgage availability bought uh, partly by the mini budget in September 22. Within two years our appraisal assumptions have deteriorated significantly which has impacted the viability of the scheme and its ability to deliver policy compliant levels of affordable housing and section uh, 106 contributions of £196,000. Our problem is summarised in one word, it's inflation. According to the BCIS all in tender price index, costs have increased by circa 9.5% since the first quarter of 22 when the cost plan was prepared. Uh, and the second quarter of 2023 when the financial viability assessment was being discussed with the LPA's consultants. According to Nationwide and Halifax, sales values have also decreased between 2.5% and 4% in the same period. The situation is actually worse than what is referred to in the viability assessments as build cost inflation has increased by 16.5% since we bought the site in March 21. And the benchmark land value used by the council's consultants was limited to £740,000 as opposed to the actual sum we paid the council of £1.125 million. An independent financial, financial viability assessment was prepared for submission by our consultants, which was reviewed by the council's advisors, CPI. It was a rigorous exercise that took nine months to conclude. Grant funding was also sourced from West Midlands Combined Authority as well as development finance on the basis of their conclusions that proposed warranted the support. The proposition warranted the support. The Council's independent assessment confirmed that despite grant funding being available, the scheme was deemed unviable and unable to deliver contributions in full given the expected developer's return for risk was not achieved. However, Central and Country are willing to accept a lower return and deliver 20% affordable housing which is two less than the original under the section under the unilateral undertaking, alongside a highways contribution of twenty three thousand. Just finish off that. Should the committee members endorse their officers' recommendation, we will be able to advise our stakeholders that we have a financially a viable scheme made possible by the council and West Midlands Development Agency, and press the button on the start date this summer. Without your support, we just won't be able to commence the works. Thank you. Right. Andrew, I should answer any questions the members had. Okay, okay, so go straight. Right, Thomas. Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think I've read the report. I'm very satisfied with CBRE's um, assessment viability. Um, I accept that. I, I think it's a shame we're losing two units of affordable housing considering the housing crisis that could be fighting itself in. But, it, it is what it is with the cost, the cost of everything going through the roof. So, um, as, as it stands, I'm happy to accept the fact that due to viability, we've had this change. Uh, John. Um, I appreciate the financial uh, strain that all sorts of businesses are under at the moment. Um, however, affordable social housing is a priority of the Borough Council. Um, 
So I can't really, I, I, have, I have no objection to, to the, uh, the original plan itself, but I don't know whether I can support the reduction of the social housing, and I'm also very disappointed to see such a, a dramatic reduction in Section 106 money. Um, and it, it's not to say that I wouldn't support this application in some form in the future. Um, my personal recommendation uh, would be that we deferred the uh, decision to be made on this application and perhaps had a side visit to see what local amenities are available uh, and what impact this, this development would have without that extra Section 106 money on that, on that locality. Okay. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lucer. Uh, yeah, Kenton Dubbull, sorry. Right. I was just yeah, good. I've just got a couple of questions. I'm a bit confused because it says in the report applicants is Homes England, but it then, then says central and country. So who is the applicant? Uh, and because uh, if it's Homes England, I was a bit con concerned that it was so profit driven. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, is that uh, if, you know, with the loss of the education contribution, the kids are still going to be there and they're still going to need to be educated. So where is this shortfall of, of money going to come from? Yeah, it's a bit of a technicality, the first question. It's because um, you'll notice that the reference number is still the 2019 one, which is the yeah. outline consent. And that's why um, the applicant is, is still shown as Homes England. The applicant for the deed of variation is the current landowner who are central and country. So hopefully that confirms that one. They're, they're a, are they a private company? Though? Yeah, they're a, they're a house builder. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and then the, the answer to the second question, and, and this is a difficult one for planners to answer because ultimately we would like, uh, and the developer would like to be um, delivering the Section 106 money in full so that it could go towards the education and the, um, and the recreation. But ultimately, the National Planning Policy Framework says that if a developer can demonstrate that a scheme isn't viable, um, then and it's been independently verified, then that has to be accepted. You, the, 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 the decision makers can still make a decision as to whether the development is acceptable without these contributions, um, but ultimately we'd have to look at the wider impacts of the scheme not being delivered. So yes, whilst they're not providing the money towards edu education, they are providing other benefits to the borough in terms of they'll be paying um, council tax. Um, they'll be pe the people that live in the houses will be employed in the borough, so they'll be um, contributing to the economics um, of the borough. Um, so it's not a pure calculation that they're not providing the education money because there are some financial benefits to it as well. Like they provide local employment. Um, to the ground workers and to the to the bricklayers, so it, I'm not saying it equalises completely, and it is taken out of different pots. Um, but that's the balance that the, the decision maker, as, as councillors, as the decision maker, you'd have to reach. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can I also just come back and point in terms of where the other finances for say education may come from? There are other available grants that are available that the council has access to that will be able to deal with the additional increase of children that are from the site. The site itself must only mitigate for the number of children's bed spaces that are coming from it, but it, it only if there is a um, deficit. If there's surplus within the system, then it wouldn't need to mitigate against it. Um, and there are available funds elsewhere outside. From the, I think it's from the DOE that, that sent it back to the council, so um, that, that can be discussed at least. Okay. Councillor Scott. Yeah, thank you. Um, one point, another 50 to 100 people coming along, and not a thought for the local surgeries, but that's another, it's not part of this, but we need to keep, keep considering that. Anyway, um, I think every excuse was given there about from small boats as to why. Uh, it's no longer viable. Two years and it's no longer viable. You wonder why sometimes developers even bother if they're going to come back to us and do this. Uh, we don't like to see it. We don't like to see it happen. The problem is, I think our hands are tied on this. Um, the viability study says it's not viable. The council's own independence says it's not viable. So I don't see where we can go with this. Um, if we were to refuse it, we would lose, I think we would lose any appeal. I'm not prepared to put the council under that. 
Well, I do wish it, uh, the developers could come forward with a more viable plan to start off with so we didn't have to keep addressing this. I'll have to support it because value of law suggests I should, but I'm personally not happy with it at all. I'm Rick. Oh, I was, yes. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I can't speak to first. first. In practice, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I do not welcome deeds of variation on any planning applications unless there are exceptional circumstances where another part of that development is bringing forward something of essential community benefit. What I see within this deed is there's a loss of everything here. I take on board what um, Mr. Gittins is saying about residents coming in and contributing, but they're also using our services. So they've got to be paid for out of that as well. Um, so, given the advice that's contained within this report, I have to say I am very reluctantly going to say I have to support it, although whatever the National Planning Policy Framework says about uh, profits and margins and everything else, in my view, that's a bit of tosh and needs to be taken out as quickly as possible. You take risks in life, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Um, not actually very pleased with the, uh, uh, the recommendation of variations, but uh, we all know that what happened in the last two, three years, cost of living, property prices, you know, the material prices going up, everything else. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the, the, we still got about 20% of the uh, affordable housing there. And we still got some contribution going towards the uh, uh, the uh, road uh, uh, um, I think uh, I don't think I have any choice but to you know say that you know we accept this one with a heavy heart. I would say yes, we accept that because I don't see any other way out of this. Andrew, do you want to come back in on any particular point, or are you are you happy for it to go for a vote? Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that the, the viability actually shows that even with the grant from the West Mids Combined Authority for the Brownfield site, they're contributing four hundred and thirty thousand. Um, that the, the developer is still below the expected um, profit margin, which has been agreed by CBRE, and, and the. This is a strange site because it looks like most sites in Telford, it looks like a greenfield site, but it's actually littered with um, with mines. Um, and and off, it's the unknown mines that are the problem because if you know where every mine on site is, you can legislate for the cost, but it's one when um, extra ones are found, which was the case here, that you, you pour in money into the ground in, in the form of concrete. So, that was it. thank you, Chair. Right? Are you okay? Yeah? yeah. Right. Could I make the recommendation, please? Yes, okay, thank you, thank you, Thomas. Um, is everyone uh, for voting for the uh, recommendation? Okay, thank you. It's unanimous, thank you. Right, okay. Um, the last one um, is uh, TWC 2022. 0969, uh, the flower pot 16A frame lane, Dosley. Um, right, and you out back on again, Andrew? It's a bit of the last one here, so yeah. Um, <laughs> so the application of the erection of the tax double garage. Um, the application has been called into committee by Dorley Hatton Parish Council, um, and officer recommendation is for approval <coughs> subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, right. Well, we might as well go straight forward to the written written statement. So, um, the, this is on behalf of Dorley Hamlets Parish Council, and they are against the application. All right. So, sh shall I, yeah, shall I read? Or, or Andrew? Or Kira. Sorry, Kira. Dorley Hamlets Parish Council would like to object to this planning application for the following reasons. One, the application is for the erection of a detached double garage as an addition to a residential home. It is clear from the size and scale of the building shown in the plans that this is definitely not a normal size domestic garage 
and has all the characteristics of a commercial building. Plans show the building with two large tractors within it and sufficient room for more vehicles. Two, the property appears to already have a garage and sufficient space to create a double garage residential size by extending the present building adjacent to the house. Three, the application cites the proposed building remotely from the applicant's dwelling behind and adjacent to other properties and access to the garage from Frame Lane would require passing at least seven other properties. Four, the orientation of the proposed building does not match the access route from Frame Lane and suggests a separate access would be sought or created onto German Drive, a residential cul-de-sac at the rear of the property. Five, no information is provided to explain the requirement or intended use of this property, but it has all the hallmarks of being a commercial building set into the middle of an existing residential area. And six, there are several residential properties very close to the proposed building and residents may not be aware of the full implications of this application and its potential impact on their properties. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Leo. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, can I open it up to... Sorry, the, oh, so, come up with the yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, thank sorry, you. sorry, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so the garage will be situated to the east um, of the application site on a parcel of land previously granted permission uh, to convert from what we call open space uh, to garden land. In respect to the footprint, this will be 56 square metres, uh, derived by um, dimensions of 7 by 8 metres. Now a standard double garage is 6.3 by 6.3 metres externally, so it's only 0.7 larger in one elevation and then um, 1.7 larger on, on the other one. The, during the course of the application we've received amended plans to um, reduce the garage from a, a pitched roof um, to a flat roof. That's reduced its overall height down from 5.5 metres to three metres in height. In addition, the applicant has moved the garage, um, so it's now 2.5 and two metres off the respective boundaries, and this will allow uh, the planting of some soft landscaping. Just in response to the Parish Council's comments, um, the applicant has confirmed that he does own um, a number of vintage tractors as a hobby, um, and they will be stored within the garage. They're actually on the land as it is anyway, so the garage will just provide internal storage for them. And we've proposed conditions to um, prevent any residential um, or domestic uh, use, including living accommodation, so it couldn't be used as a summer house, for example. Um, no commercial or business um, purposes, and that the uh, garage should remain in the ownership and should not be sublet to number 16A, um, frame lane which is the application site and then finally there is an existing garage um, on the site or within the red line um, the reason for this is that the applicant owns number 16a frame lane and number 19 frame lane if the number 19 was sold or let the garage actually would go with that, which would mean that number 16 wouldn't have a garage. So that's the, um, the rationale for the provision of a chair. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Right, open it up. Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, yeah, I went to have a look at this one because I couldn't think where it was exactly, to be honest. Um, but while I was trespassing on the land, the owner came out and said, what do you want? Uh, we turned out to be quite an engaging fellow, really. I, I do believe that these are for domestic reasons only. He's got a couple of tractors, small tractors, which is his hobby. He wants to house them. I think that's an awful lot of... The, we hear it a lot when, when people say, ah, oh, but it could be commercial. Well, we don't know that, and it's not going to be. I'm convinced, personally, it's not going to be. It's a mountain out of a molehill, this one. It is a reasonable request to put the double garage down there. It won't look out of place. If you go and have a look at it, you'll see that. In fact, the guy owns most of the land around that as well, the other side. Um, so I, I just think that this is really... Uh, I don't even see why it's come to this committee, to be honest. And I'm also surprised that if the local parish council was so het up about it, not one of them could come and represent and to send a letter. For me, it's a no-brainer. I will say yes. Hmm? Anybody else? Yeah, much poorer. 
I think uh, that's, 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 that's yeah, that's move, that's move. That's yeah, of course you can. Have they said what purpose they're going to use this carriages for? Storage. They're not going to use to repair tractors, are they? Something like that. Just to inject so The applicant owns a number of vintage tractors, yeah. um, so they're already stored on the land. Okay. So he, he might um, repair the tractors, but only as a hobby. Um, oh, yeah. Which, not yeah, not as a business, no. and, and that will be conditioned as well. So it's not as if um, um, he can repair, repair tractors or even cars for other people. He can, it will just be, he can keep and maintain his own tractor, that's it, or, yeah. or his own car. So, so how long are they used to, you know, the, like the business we start repairing other people's things? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right, yeah. That'd be uh, I, I can't see any reason to know that we get Opposed for a vote on, on this one, and seconded, yes. So, everyone for the... Yeah, tractors. Tractors, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that's all. So can I thank you all for attending tonight? Thank you for your help, and um, we'll see you again.